Our service continues today with a reading from 1 Timothy chapter 6. Is money the root of all evil, or is it something else? This lesson reminds us that there's nothing wrong with money or any of God's blessings. So listen to the warning and the promise of God's word. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, of Jesus Christ, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Alleluia. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Alleluia. Our gospel lesson today from Luke chapter 16. Jesus reminds us today that real success is not found in earthly riches, but is found in hearing and believing his word. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so they will not come also to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we'll consider our gospel lesson from the Gospel of Luke. I'll read the final verse. 
Jesus said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, I hadn't seen it initially, but now I've seen it a few times. Maybe you saw it as soon as it was on. It was on Tuesday night during the presidential debate. It was a commercial. I'll show you a picture of it. This gentleman comes on and he says, Hi, I'm Ron Reagan. As I understand, he's the son of the former president. And he starts out the commercial and he says, I'm an unabashed atheist. Of course, an atheist would be someone who doesn't believe that there's a God. His commercial, 30 Seconds, talks about the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He talks about separation of church and state. And then at the end of the commercial, he says this. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Someone alerted me to the commercial and I could hardly believe that that was on, but I watched it and then I watched it again and that's exactly what he says. I, I did a little study on the commercial actually and discovered that it was actually produced back in 2014 and it's been about five years before they've been able to put it on TV. They were waiting for someone, I guess, to be able to accept the ad and, and show it as a commercial. And this past week they did. And it's startling when you hear it said, not afraid of burning in hell. But the more I've thought about the commercial, I've actually come to kind of appreciate it. At least in one way. Because what the author here does is he connects what a person believes and then how they live to eternity. And that's not something that we do a lot in our secularly focused world, is it? So I've actually come to appreciate it a little bit. Because maybe it makes some people think. Even if he's sort of mocking the idea, it still makes you think about your life and about your eternal life. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to do for us this morning as well. So we'll consider that today as I'd like you to think about the three mistakes made today by the rich man. Before we get to this illustration that Jesus gives, it's always helpful for us to understand why does Jesus say it? What is the context? And here's what it is. A few verses before our lesson, it says, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. They were making fun of Jesus. They were looking down at him. And so Jesus tells us this. He says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. It may have looked something like this. It says that he was dressed in purple. To understand that, it's a little bit different than it is today. Today we have synthetic dyes and you can make any color that you want. Back in those days, there was a little sea snail about
about maybe this long. You've maybe even seen those shells uh, on the beach if you went south. You had to collect thousands of those shells to be able to get that dye out to make the color purple. And so it cost a lot of money. So purple was always associated with people who had money or people in royalty, people who were famous. And that's what this man had. He had purple clothes. He had fine linens. He had, he had nice clothes. And not only did he have that, but this other man is just waiting to find scraps that would fall from his table. So he had good food. And it says he also had a gate to his house. So he didn't like live in a tent somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. He had a decent house. So he had nice clothes. He had good food. He had a decent house. And he was deceived. He was deceived by wealth. He was deceived because he had all these things. He had a good life. His standard of living was a lot higher than a lot of other people's of his day. And he was healthy. He had his strength. But he was deceived. Because for him, Physically, things were going well. And you know what happens sometimes when things are going well physically, it almost makes you think that that also means that things are going well spiritually. I read a, a quote from a man named John Chrysostom. He lived in the 300s. And he was talking about the thoughts of this time. He said, Lazarus, we'll talk about him in a minute. He said, he also likely endured condemnation from all. For it was then believed that poverty and sickness were God's punishment on the unworthy. While health and wealth were God's reward for the virtuous. Do you get the thought? That someone who was doing well physically began to think, I'm also doing well spiritually. Obviously God is pleased with me because I have nice clothes and good food and a decent house. Obviously, that means things are right between me and God. And this man over here, who is poor and sick, that means things are not right between him and God. So that was the belief. You know, it's interesting today, if you go to the bookstore, or you look at some of the top-selling Christian books, some of the top Christian authors, the folks who are on TV today, on the Christian stations, they say pretty much the same thing. Your health and your wealth, that's kind of a sign. Things between you and God are right. Not much has changed. You wonder today if people in the United States are making the first mistake, deceived by wealth. See what else happens in the lesson. Because it says at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and Longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, says then, even the dogs came and licked his sores. 
You know, dogs in those days were considered kind of unclean, bad animals. And just think of the thought of someone so poor and someone so sick that dogs would come to lick your open sores. What that must have been like. And just living with this longing of maybe something will fall off of this rich man's table and maybe I could just grab that and have something to eat today. What a thought. And then to have the perhaps the people around you believing, see, that proves that your life is wrong and you're bad and your relationship with God is wrong and bad. What a life, huh? What a life to live. Of course, when we look at later what takes place, we realize that that's really all wrong, isn't it? It's another one of the mistakes. And from the rich man's point of view, his second mistake is thinking that he just has one life to live. It's his life here on this earth. The implication of the lesson was here was a man he could help. He had the means to do it. The man was right there. But the implication is he didn't do it. He wanted to keep it for himself. He was living for this life. The man took great care of his body. Just not his soul. His body, he gave everything that it possibly could ever want. He just didn't take care of his soul. As he lived in luxury every day. It's easy to do, isn't it? You just get kind of caught up in the lifestyle. It's easy to just start thinking about this life and what's going on today and what's going on tomorrow and what do I need for the next day. I mean, it seems like that's what everybody else is thinking and then pretty soon that's what we're thinking too, right? It just kind of happens. And before you know it, you're just living for this life for life on this earth. And you sort of forget about the life to come. Of course, as the lesson goes on, Jesus says both these men die. Lazarus, it says, goes to Abraham's side, which is just another way of saying that Lazarus went to heaven. Now, don't let the lesson confuse you. In no way is Jesus suggesting that because he suffered in life or because he was poor, that's why he went to heaven. We know that's not why people go to heaven. People go to heaven who believe and trust in Jesus as their Savior. The rich man also dies, and he goes to hell. And again, he doesn't go to hell because he was rich, because there's nothing wrong with the blessings that God gives to a person. But while he's in hell, uh, the light goes on. And now he's suddenly concerned about other people, which it didn't seem like he was necessarily so concerned about before, but now he is. And he's concerned about his family. And he says, please give a warning to my family so that they will not come to this place of torment. He doesn't want his brothers to suffer the same fate that he is suffering. Perhaps those were his brothers at this big feast he was enjoying. But in so doing, he realized in this discussion here that he made the third mistake. And the third mistake is that he failed to see the power of the Word of God. 
that while he was on earth, while he was alive, during his time of grace, he focused on his body and not his soul. And as Jesus here speaking to the Pharisees, he's reminding them of that very same truth. That they can hear and they have the powerful word of God. But are they listening to it? Do they believe it? He failed to see the power of the word of God in his own life, and now he also fails to see the power of the word of God for his family. Because he suggests to them that what they need is to have someone come back from the dead so that they will believe. And the answer that he gets is, let them listen to Moses and the prophets. And, and if you've heard that phrase before, Moses and the prophets, that's just another way of saying, like, listen to the Old Testament, or we'd say just listen to the Bible. He's saying just listen to what the God's Word says. And he says, no, he says, my family's not going to listen to the Bible. They need to have something special. They need to have a special sign in their life. Someone needs to come back from the dead to sort of wake them up. And here's the answer that he gets. If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, meaning if they don't listen to God's word now, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And do you see what Jesus is doing there? He's talking to the Pharisees. Do you know what's about to happen very soon? He's going to die and then rise from the dead. He's making the third mistake. Failing to see the power in the word of God. This past week, the Pew Research Center uh, put out this study that they had completed. They've been doing this for many years. The slide is a little bit small. It'll be difficult to see, but you can get the idea. They go around every year asking people, what's your religious beliefs or what's your religious uh, connection? And if you see the top one, that line there represents uh, the number of people in the United States that indicate Christianity as their belief system. And you'll notice it's going the wrong way. It's going down. In fact, I believe the study even suggested it's the lowest percentage-wise that it's ever been. The chart on the bottom, the graph on the bottom, it is going up. And that's the folks who say, you know, What's your religious connection? What is it? And they say, none. And the number of nuns in America is going up. And the number of individuals who say, Christianity is my belief system, is going down. We're becoming more secular. We're becoming less focused on the Word of God. And I wonder sometimes if in our own country today, if we're not making the three mistakes even now, the deceitfulness of wealth, that because my earthly life is going pretty well, I have nice clothes, I eat good food, got a decent house, Everything must be right with God. That I'm just living for this life. That my focus is on this life. That my thoughts are on this life. That my intentions are all about this life. I'm taking good care of my body. But am I taking care of my soul? And the third mistake. Do I trust the power of God's word for myself 
and for my family? Do I care about it? Do I read it? Do I study it? Do I believe it? Do I live it in my life? Or am I just kind of going with the flow of everybody else, it would seem? That's just living for the here and now. That's focused on this world. The stuff of this life. I'm just all wrapped up in the here and now. Is that true in our lives? Is it true for you? And what about for others? Do we lose our mission zeal? Do we lose our desire to reach out and help others with their physical needs when we see them around us and we know they need help? And we have the ability to do it. And to help others. When it comes to the most important treasure we could share. The powerful word of God. Just close with this today. This past week we hosted the Red Wing Pastors Conference. We had about 20 or so pastors here. We heard papers on things like what's going on in terms of things like Islam, the Catholic Church, the ELCA Church, presentations on those things with a special emphasis on the Word of God. And in one of the devotions, the leader talked to us as pastors and talked to us about the importance of continuing to listen to the Word of God and read it and learn it and memorize it for our lives and to speak it out loud so that we know it and can communicate it to our congregations. Because you understand the challenge. Sometimes you look out there in the world and it seems that everybody's kind of drifting the other way. Or you see people who are living the high life and there's a little part of you that says, I kind of want to live the high life too. And I'd rather focus on that. And I don't necessarily want to share with other people. I don't want to be focused on their needs. I'd rather think about what I want. <laughs> and sometimes it seems that people don't even really study and learn the Word of God anymore. And that if you do such a thing, it's like you're going to be all alone. So be reminded today of Jesus' promise. He's going to rise again. And he did. And he's coming again. To take all those people who've been waiting for him home. People who perhaps in this life were poor in an earthly sense, but were rich in Christ. For people who are maybe had sores and illnesses and sicknesses. And maybe some people look down on them. But they held on to the one thing needful. The promises in the word of God. And that he would return to take them home. If you were going to make a commercial today. What would you say? I think we just said it. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. There's your commercial. Amen.